So welcome to this Travel Weekly webcast. I'm Ian Taylor and I'm joined by Charlie Gordon, Director of Market Research Group, uh, Kantar Media. Charlie's going to share Kantar's latest insights on UK consumer holiday behaviour and intentions with some comparative data uh, from other markets. He'll speak for about 15 minutes and we'll follow with a brief Q&A. Charlie, over to you. Hi, Ian. Um, well, thank you for having us travel weekly. Um, and yeah, what I'm going to do is just talk through the latest um, TGI findings on holidays kind of for the year gone and for the year ahead and just see what the trends can tell us. Um, so I'll start um, by quickly just um, talking about what Kantar Media's TGI survey is, for those of you who don't know. So TGI data is built on a representative sample of 24,000 adults aged 15 plus across Great Britain. Um, and what the purpose of TGI is, is really it's a single survey, so single source data exploring all aspects of adult life, really. So we look at things like demographics, the products people use, the brands they use, how they feel about those products. And we do that across a huge range of different categories. So from things like food to motoring to travel and leisure, um, and kind of underlying, I guess, a lot of that is then how people consume media and how that can be utilized to kind of help inform their choices in some of those other areas. Um, so TGI data is really used extensively by agencies, brands and media owners in media planning purposes, and also just to understand and engage consumer targets. Um, so that's a bit about TGI. And obviously, if you wish to know more, do get in touch um, and we can help you there. Um, so what we've seen is that over the last year, we had over 29 million people, adults going on holiday. Um, I should say that is adults um, that we're talking about there. Obviously, if you think about things like the International Passenger Survey and so on, you would think these numbers seem low. But this is not counting, for example, repeat trips. So it's just people who've said, yes, I've been abroad in the last year, effectively, or on holiday in Britain. Um, of that 29 million three quarters of them took a holiday in Britain um, and about three fifths went abroad. So a slight skew to GB inevitably, because if we're talking about multiple holidays, lots of people will have done short breaks or holidays in Britain alongside holidays abroad. Um, but those numbers have been growing over the last few years. Obviously, the kind of major thing for travel in recent years was obviously the COVID pandemic. And what we've been really kind of seeing over the last few years in the data is just the slow return to the point where we're now kind of back at levels that we would have expected to see pre-COVID. It's been a kind of slow build. And really, this chart kind of brings that home. Um, I should say there is a bit of a lag in the data here, because when we've asked in this, have you gone on holiday in the past 12 months? Obviously, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, we were asking people about the previous year. So lots of people had been on holiday abroad, for example. But by the time we were getting into our late 2020, 21 data, obviously people hadn't because of the pandemic and lockdowns and so on and the inability to travel. But what we see really is that this kind of figure back in 20, 2024, so reflecting the last year, is now back to the levels we saw before the pandemic. The gap between British holidays and going abroad has really come back to a similar kind of level that we were seeing before. Um, so demand for domestic holidays might well have peaked in that kind of 2022, 23 region um, and abroad very much kind of becoming the focus again. So what are we seeing heading into 2024? Um, well, for the first time in several years, we're actually seeing a kind of a fairly stable picture here. Um, kind of in line with the market, our data seems to be reflecting that bookings are slightly ahead for 2024. On the left here, we've got just a, a slight amount of people saying more likely to say they've already booked their main holiday, um, but then countering that, obviously planning to book slightly down because more people are in that left-hand side. Um, but slightly fewer people saying they're not taking a holiday. So just kind of, I guess, for the first time since we started doing these reports, slower growth, but reflecting the fact that there's been huge growth over the last few years. And I think 2024 is just about kind of building on the return to normal. 
And what's really interesting is that this year we're seeing that, you know, the kind of a lot of things like the cost of living crisis and factors that have impacted decisions over the last couple of years are maybe beginning to recede a bit. Um, we asked people as part of the TGI survey whether or not they're comfortable on their present income. Um, and what we saw in last year's data was that people who were comfortable on their present income, we had 28 percent saying they weren't planning on taking a holiday. Whereas this year, that's down to 21 percent, so 7 percent drop. Um, and similarly, people who are finding it very difficult on their present income, so perhaps have less spare cash, for example, um, but saying they're not taking a holiday, that's also down. So that kind of cost of living context just seems to be becoming less of a factor. Um, those people who are finding it very difficult on current income um, do tend to be, um, as you'd expect, kind of have lower income, although it's not always as clear cut as that because you could have high income but extensive outgoings. So that's always worth bearing in mind. Um, but they tend to be younger and also have bigger households. So as you'd expect, a bigger household with kind of large numbers of people in it leads to increased cost. Um, but yeah, the holiday seems to be something that is definitely just growing in importance over time um, as people kind of try and get back to doing what they're used to. And in terms of where people are looking to go in the year ahead, um, Europe very much remains the top target for what we ask about as the main annual holiday. We ask people about their main holiday and we also ask about other trips. Um, the main holiday, I guess we would think of as kind of, you know, the, the classic sort of summer family holiday. Um, and that's reflected in where people are talking about going. So Europe is very much the top destination here. Forty five percent of people say that's where their main holiday will be. And the top destinations for that really are Spain by some margin when you include all of the different islands and the Canaries and so on. But then also France, Greece, Italy, um, British Isles in second place and then the rest of the world at 14 percent key destinations for the rest of the world i guess remain kind of the us and then also places like sort of southeast asia um australia and so on so um but tend to be a much wider range of destinations in that rest of the world classification and the decisive factors for booking holidays really remain unchanged um we see, as you'd expect, location is the thing people are looking for, and then it's accommodation, it's the weather. The interesting thing with length of stay is that actually a lot of people are saying they will trade off things like the luxury of their travel. So they'll look at paying less for flights if it means they can extend their holiday. Um, almost half of people say that. Um, so there is a real kind of balance there around what people are prioritizing in terms of getting bang for their buck. Um, but there is a bit of a kind of generational gap, which I'll talk about in a second there in terms of what's worth paying more for when it comes to travel areas. Um, and just a quick mention for culture and activities inevitably forms part of what people look for when they're choosing destinations. But as you can see, it comes a long way behind something like the weather. Um, yeah, talking about those generation gaps, I mean, what we see is that certain elements of the kind of holiday experience resonate with different audiences. We asked a range of these and we've just picked out a couple of the interesting ones here. Um, I enjoy myself more on holiday if I book to stay in an apartment, villa, house, really trying to capture that kind of more independent travel, Airbnb type experience, I guess. Um, and what we see is that younger people are more likely to agree with this. Um, overall, it's about half of people say they, they kind of feel this way, which is actually similar to the amount of people who say they prefer to stay in hotels. Um, but for this statement, specifically 15 to 34s are much more likely to agree. And it's actually at the older end of the market, the 65 plus, where they're saying, no, you know, we, we don't really like this kind of more um, standalone holiday accommodation. Um, and on a similar note, um, when I just talked about kind of things like, you know, the luxury of travel and so on. It's worth paying for extras on flights like booking specific seats and fast boarding. I'm sure something a lot of us are kind of acclimatized to these days. 25 to 44 year olds are more likely to agree that this is something they think it's worthwhile doing. Um, whereas it's at that older end of the market, they think they're less likely to believe those represent value. So similarly, just under half people kind of agree with the statement overall. But there is a bit of a split from young and old in terms of how they see the world on that front.
Um, and this was a new question we asked about um, in our most recent data, and I think it's really interesting. We saw in 2023 that, you know, there were some quite striking kind of scenes of heat waves, of flooding and so on, particularly in southern Europe. Um, and it was just interesting to kind of consider, well, is that going to start impacting how people feel about what they do in the future? And is that maybe going to be something the market needs to think about? So we asked an agreement scale of uh, I am less likely to take a holiday in southern Europe nowadays due to the extreme weather conditions there in recent years. And what we actually saw was that 28 percent of people said they agreed with that statement. They thought that was something they would probably take into consideration. Slightly lower among people who had actually been to southern Europe in the previous 12 months. We took that as kind of Spain, Greece, Italy as the main options there. Um, but still one in five saying this is something they would you know, think about. Um, what's interesting, I guess, there is those who agree, again, are younger, um, slightly below average, um, less likely to cite weather as an important factor when booking holiday, which in some ways stands in the face of extreme weather. But I think what that probably means is they're less likely to be looking for the kind of sun and sea of traditional holidays um, is how we've kind of squared that circle. Um, and also this group have a wider range of destinations. So perhaps, you know, easier to shift away from Southern Europe because they have a broader outlook in terms of being more likely to have traveled beyond Europe into the rest of the world in the last year. Um, so just that kind of broader outlook in that slightly younger group that, as I say, we're, we're really beginning to feel like we see a generational kind of gap in terms of what people look for from holidays. And another area we see that is in the area of social media posts. And um, we asked whether or not people agree that influencer and social media posts play a big part in their holiday choices. I know certainly this is something I'm much more conscious of these days is how much my social media feeds are kind of holiday ad driven. Um, 20% overall, but actually almost half of the people who say they care about social media posts as part of their kind of holiday choice are millennials. That's the, I think, 1980, 81 through to 96. So people who are kind of in their 28 to early 40s age range. Um, and actually, if we look at, if we add Gen Z to that, which is the next generation along, so I think they're more kind of like 27 down to sort of 15, um, that's almost three quarters of the people. So really, again, a factor for younger people is this idea of social media and the role it can play um, and quite interesting, they talk about things like being more likely to say a recognized tourist destination is something they're looking for when they're booking a holiday. So almost kind of speaks to that. You know, I want to go somewhere that it has value in social media environment as well in terms of people recognizing it and it being great for pictures and so on. Um, but also worth noting that social media is an important channel for parents of younger children, um, around a third of them agreeing. So quite a, a long way up from that 20 percent. Um, and similarly, I think that certainly in my experience speaks to the fact that, you know, you want to know a lot about what's on the ground and understand what's going on. Um, particularly important for young children where you need to know what you're going to be able to offer them in terms of things to do. Um, so, yeah, a, a really kind of important channel, particularly at the younger end of the market, we would say. But of course, not all holiday makers are looking for the same thing. And what we've actually done is um, revise this year our um, TGI holiday archetypes. Um, what we do is we create ready-made segmentations for various parts of the consumer landscape, um, just so that people can kind of, you know, quickly get a grip of who are the people in the market and maybe how do they differ rather than having to spend hours kind of doing their own analysis. Um, so we've looked at people who've gone on holiday or short breaks in the past 12 months and just broken that down into these groups here. And what we've got is casual travel fanatics, who are the biggest of those groups. That's the people who perhaps enjoy going on more holidays through the year. Europe's a particularly keen destination. Obviously, it's easy to get to lots of flights available and so on. And then at the opposite end of the market, almost, we've got a sort of summer staycationers, 22% um, of holiday goers, um, more likely to have shorter breaks to stay closer to home. So lots of things like kind of traveling within GB, for example. We then have the infrequent flyers, which represent 17% of the market. Don't necessarily take lots of holidays, 
And when they do, they're often likely to go back to the same places. So it might be that, you know, they have their annual holiday in Spain or Greece or something, but perhaps not as kind of broad an outreach as the travel fanatics. Um, school holiday families, I think, is probably fairly self-explanatory. Um, they're really driven by what's available to them in the school holidays. And really the choices they make are about making sure that there are things the entire family can do, particularly children and and then probably, I guess, what we'd call the top end of the market, the premium globe trotters, which is 11 percent of holiday goers. Um, and they're ones who, again, much more likely to go on lots of holidays, more likely to go to the rest of the world. So beyond Europe and above um, and particularly kind of focusing on more luxurious experiences, things like staying in nicer resorts and so on. So it just gives you a sense of you know how that market of holiday makers can be broken down and how they look for different things and have different needs. I'll just talk about a couple of them very quickly, just to give you a bit more of a flavor. Um, so I talked about summer staycationers um, as being more likely to take holidays in GB. And that's driven by, you know, the difficulty and the hassle of travel, I guess. They like going to places which are easy to get to so they can jump in the car and drive there. They're a bit older, uh, average age 55 a bit less money to spend, average income slightly down on the average, um, and more likely to agree that holidays abroad are less appealing these days. Um, but even so, 70% of this group have already booked or are planning to book a trip for 2024. So still, you know, high engagement with the idea of holiday is just it's more likely to be domestic. Whereas if we look at premium globe trotters, so I was just describing, I say the, the kind of the highest earning group um, a lot higher than the average um, salary. Average age is bang on average, 47 years old, kind of reflecting the population. Um, a quarter of them have stayed at an all-inclusive hotel in the past 12 months, so really driving that kind of market of, you know, bigger spend up front. Um, and actually more likely to agree that influencer and social media posts are playing a big part in holiday choices. So, Again, a group who have the money to effectively look out for these things and then act on what they see. Um, and perhaps reflecting that higher income, 81% of them have already booked a trip um, or planning to book for 2024. So above what we've seen for that um, summer staycationers group. Um, so, yeah, they're just some interesting ways of being able to look at the market. Um, finally, really, um, just to talk about British holiday plans in the wider context, and I think this is particularly interesting because of how um, Great Britain's rebounded this year. Um, we looked at the same data in 2023, and GB was actually behind, I think, Germany, France, Sweden, um, in terms of planning to travel in the next six months. Um, but what we see in 2024 looking ahead is that more Brits than anywhere else are planning on getting abroad in the next six months, 56%. Um, so uh, quite a nice jump on 2023, whereas the other markets have kind of stabilised or just slightly on the way down. Um, so it looks like Britain very much kind of leading the way in terms of travel for 2024. Um, so, yeah, really just to summarise, I mean, I think what we would say is that the gap between holidaying in Britain and going abroad is basically looking like it did back before the pandemic, after a number of years where obviously the choice to holiday domestically was either almost effectively mandated or was just seen as the easier option because of economics or other factors. Um, but yeah, now it looks like we're back to kind of what we were seeing in 2018, 19. Um, 2024 looks like another strong year. Um, Less year on year growth than before, but again, because things are starting to stabilize, but still slightly up on 2023, which I think is reflecting probably what the market seems to be seeing so far. Um, cost of living looks like being less of a factor. We've seen at both ends of the scale, people who are comfortable financially, but also people who aren't so comfortable financially, more likely to prior prioritize a holiday um, in the year ahead. Um, and just on that point that I've just been talking about, British consumers actually seem to be kind of where the growth for the first half of 2024 is versus either kind of stability or slight contraction elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, that's everything, really. Um, and hoping it looks like a, another good year for the travel industry in 2024. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, a lot 
in there. Just to clarify, um, all the data on holidaymakers' intentions for 2024 was from a January uh, re release, and this is based on adults who booked or are planning to book a, ho a holiday in, in, in this year. Right. Yeah. And um, I was struck by um, the finding that half said they would trade the length of stay um, with the cost of travel uh, if they could find cheaper flights and, and so on. Um, interesting because research Travel Weekly uh, had done with consumers uh, showed that people, a significant proportion of people would probably go away for less time this year uh, ab abroad because of uh, because of costs. But your findings were that people would go longer if they could find a, a, a good deal. So it will be interesting to see how that plays out, given that airfares remain probably higher than people uh, were used to pre-pandemic uh, at, at the moment. Um, I was struck by the significant numbers sensitive to changing conditions in Europe. You found 28% of adults planning to travel, um, more so more than one in four, and one in five who'd visited Southern Europe in, in the last 12 months. That's a significant finding, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we necessarily expected to see the numbers kind of that strong. I mean, we should couch it by saying that over a third said they didn't think it was a factor. Um, but certainly the fact that, you know, there are over a quarter of people out there in the market saying, well, actually, is it a good idea to book that trip if it's going to be 45 degrees or whatever creates challenges for, I guess, what we see as the kind of traditional holiday heartlands for British consumers. And that that was a question you hadn't asked before, but you will be asking going forward. Presumably. I would imagine we will be asking that going forward. Yes, because we'll certainly want to keep an eye on that. I mean, I think, you know, if the weather behaves this year, we may see it look different. Um, but if things remain the same, then I think we'll we'll be keeping a close eye on that trend, certainly. OK. And the, the proportion was higher amongst uh, younger adults. Um Presumably, this would include those with young children, which would make sense, I guess. Yeah, we tend to see certainly now that younger adults, are, you know, kind of includes that millennial group who are actually having their own families and more likely to have play school, primary school children. Um, yeah, obviously, they're going to be looking to protect families more. Um, and also, I think there is just a kind of generational gap where the the outlook of where you can go and what perhaps represents a family holiday is a bit broader than it was historically you know things like the weather being a less important factor which as i think i said when talking through that slide you know maybe means it doesn't have to always be about you know kind of sunshine and seaside there are other things people can do okay um i was somewhat surprised by one in five saying they were the influencer or social media posts played a big part in their holiday choices and it was getting up towards half of those in the millennial uh, uh, generation. So that's people, what, in their late 20s to early 40s? Yeah, that's um, right. It, it, does that fit with other data you, you've seen? Yeah, it seems to be backed up and across sectors as well, where the role of influencers is just much more important in terms of people being exposed to things. Um, what we didn't ask is exactly where that breaks down across Instagram, TikTok, etc. Um, but I think seeing that being so strongly driven by that generation didn't feel surprising to us at all. No. Oh, okay. And and again, that's um, younger adults, millennials, and the, those younger than the millennials, Generation Z. So that would include again parents of younger children. Yeah, and the data reflected that. So we saw a third of parents of young children saying that that played a key role for them in holiday destinations. I can actually speak from personal experience as someone who booked a holiday last year purely on the basis of someone I follow on social media, kind of, you know, flying the flag for a resort that we ended up going to. So and it's that it's almost that level of kind of personal, you know, engagement slash trust that people have with those influencers and people they choose to follow that allows them to feel confident about the decisions they're making because they know they represent the things they like and they're looking for. Okay. And and 
relating to the same findings, most um, were likely to say um, a recognised tourist destination was the most important factor in booking their main holiday. That suggests influencers and social media posts are focusing demand on recognised destinations rather than widening the the focus for 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 people. Would you say? I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess exactly what influencers are trying to do and where they're going is probably to some degree driven by who's trying to book them. Um, mm -hmm. But what people seem to be responding to are the things they know well and the things that they say, oh, that looks great. Um, so, yeah, you know, recognisable destinations that are, you know, kind of photogenic and so on, um, I think seems to be the thing that people are kind of picking up on from those people. OK, um, I was also surprised by the... the... 44% agreed it was worth paying for extras on flights, like booking specific seats and fast boarding, because people don't seem to want to pay extra to put a bag in the hole, do they? <laughs> do they? It's, um, you see people carrying almost everything on on, on with them. Uh, but again, that was 25 to 44-year-olds who were most likely to, uh, to, to agree with that, and older people um, uh, less so. So there's... there's there's a division sort of it, up to the, those younger than mid 40s and those over in a lot of these um, areas you, you, you've asked people about. Yeah, it seems to be a kind of recurring theme that that line around the mid 40s is really when people start to see the market differently. I think in terms of paying for extras. I mean, you've mentioned it a couple of times and we've talked about it in this deck that, you know, things like the minute you have two toddlers with you, for example, paying extra to make sure you're sat in the seats you want to sit in and that you're getting on the plane earlier and whatever become things that are just sensible to do. You know, they take stress out of the equation. So perhaps that's where the value is. Um, but also, I suspect part of the factor there is that, you know, a generation of people have grown up just thinking that's what you have to do to do it. Whereas there's an older generation who remember the days when you booked your flight and you got to choose your seat and do all these other things and there was no extra charge. So the, the resistance to it, I guess, is there as a result. Yeah, OK, that's um, that's a good point. Well, Charlie, these are your your summary conclusions. Uh, make, you know, pleasant hearing for those in the, the, the travel industry, don't they? That 2024 looks like another strong year for holidays. The cost of living, living looks to be less of a factor in decisions. And um, UK uh, consumers seem determined to book holidays, even if they face financial uh, constraints that, uh, that seem them cut back on other areas of discretionary spending. Yeah, and we asked less about that this year. Previously, we've gone quite deep into, you know, would you pick a holiday over a home renovations or a new car or so on? But what we saw in the data for a number of years was just people always saying holidays are priority, holidays are priority. So there didn't seem much point in kind of going any further with that. But yeah, when we look at then actually the intention, that seems to bear out that people are just kind of ring fencing that idea of a holiday and actually putting more kind of focus on it this year as the options broaden okay and if people want to um hear about more of these uh, findings or find out more about Kantar research can they contact you directly they certainly can my email address should be on screen now um as is our website and we would love to hear from you um we can happily talk further through these findings in a bit more detail or if there are specific markets people are interested in yeah, we would absolutely um, be delighted to take people through a bit more and find out um, how we can help. Charlie, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. A pleasure as always.